As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. No matter where I go and no matter where I be, I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. darkness that the light has come sing it to the nations look at what the Lord has done sing it to the daughters sing it to the sons to every generation look at what the Lord has done sing it to the darkness the light has come. Sing it to the nations. Look at what the Lord has done. As I bow before you, Lord, I will rise in confidence. I will see your goodness, Lord, in the land I'm living in. No matter where I go And no matter where I've been I will see your goodness, Lord In the land I'm living in I bow before you, Lord I will rise in confidence I will see your goodness, Lord In the land I'm living in No matter
beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. He didn't want heaven without. So Jesus, you.
powerful name it is the name of Jesus. If you have your Bibles today, would you find the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3? 1 Peter, chapter 3. We're going to pick up where we left off last time. 1 Peter chapter 3, as you're finding that, let me just say, I'm very impressed with the brake bills because, wow, how'd you get all that put away? Man, y'all must have been here all night last night. They had this thing decorated to the max for the wedding yesterday, so I appreciate y'all getting everything back so we're ready for this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to begin reading with verse 8. Finally, that's the word you want to hear your pastor say, right? Finally. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to do this, that you may inherit a blessing. For... He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. For three weeks now, we have been examining Peter's call for born-again believers to live in an honorable way, to have their conduct honorable among the world. That is to live above reproach, to live in excellence. And today we get to Peter's summation of what he's been saying, kind of his final point in this part of his sermon, so to speak. He says, finally, all of you. In other words, he's kind of saying in summation, all of you as sojourners and pilgrims, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, there are three things I want you to do. Three things that kind of sum up what we've talked about since chapter 2, verse 11. He says, finally, in summation, have the right attitudes, have the right actions, and you can expect certain accolades from your Heavenly Father. And so we're going to sum up the last three weeks just in those three things. Attitudes of excellence, actions of excellence, and accolades of excellence. Now I'm going to warn you as we get started, like most good pastors, when Peter comes to his finally statement, his last point, he carries it out and drags it out and makes it as long as he can. So just get ready for that. Let's see what Peter has to say in summing this up about living with excellence. He begins with having attitudes of excellence. He reminds people that this must start within the heart and the mind. If we're going to live above reproach as God's children, that is, those people who have come to this place where they have fallen in repentance, that is, they have turned from their old way of living to express a genuine trust in Jesus as the only one who can rescue them from sin, they have yielded to his lordship. He has become boss of everything in their life. They have yielded to Jesus as their savior. Those people who have done that are called to live lives of excellence among the world, to live above reproach in the eyes of those who don't know Jesus. And Peter says it must start with your heart. It's in your attitude where this will play out. He's calling believers to develop proper attitudes of excellence, to live out excellence. And he's going to mention several. For the sake of time, I'm going to jump right in and get to moving. Here's the first one. In verse 8, he says, an attitude of excellence involves being of one mind. Being of one mind. You see that together there in uh, verse 8? Finally, all of you, be of one mind. That's a unity and harmony in the way we think. But it's not talking about unity and harmony 
in your individual mind, you should be in harmony with yourself. If you're not, you might have bigger problems than I can deal with. It's talking about unity and harmony of mind among the believers. Being in unity and harmony within the church. Having a like-minded commitment to biblical truth. The reality is, if we're going to have an attitude of excellence and live out excellence, we must have a unified commitment to the truth of God's word, the standard of God's word, the truth of the gospel, the reality of Christ. We must be unified in teaching and living out the truth of Scripture, the standards of God. We must be unified in that. Remember, Peter is writing to a church, to believers who are under persecution, who are suffering. And he's challenging them to live out excellence in the midst of suffering. And he says, for you as a group of born-again believers to do that, you must be united, unified in your commitment to the truth of God's word, in teaching the truth and living out the truth. You have to be in harmony with the truth in the eyes of one another. What Peter's referring to here is a harmony simply based on our faith in Christ. We should be unified and united because of our faith in Christ. We have one Savior. We've been called into one redemption. We have one hope. It's in Jesus. Because of our faith in Christ, there should be a unifying agent among us. In Ephesians 4, beginning of verse 4, the scripture says, There is one body, there is one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. One. We are united in Christ. There should be a unity among the believers that allows us to pursue lives of excellence among a lost world. That unifying agent, the one thing that is common to all of us, regardless of background, regardless of demographics, regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of who we were or what we might be, the common unifying agent is the reality that we all have been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ when we came to faith in him. There's a commonality there that unifies us. Unified hearts are hearts transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who you are or what your background is. If you've come to the place of repentance and faith in Christ, whereby he has transformed you into a new creation, you and I have something in common, and we can be unified in that. There should be unity simply based on who we are in Christ for us to live out excellence in this world. This is so important. In fact, Jesus himself prayed for this to happen. You can go back when you have time and look at John 17. And in John 17, you're going to find that Jesus took time to pray for you and I, believers who would come to be, the church who would form. And he prayed that there would be a unity of spirit, a single-mindedness among those believers. He prayed for a spiritual unity that would serve to promote the gospel that would serve to advance his kingdom. He prayed for a unity that would validify and verify that he is God incarnate, come in human form for the purpose of redeeming the world. He prayed for a unity among the church, a single-mindedness, a single-minded commitment to him, to his gospel, to his truth. And my friends, unity of the believers that's mentioned here is a far-reaching unity. This is, this is far beyond a simple harmonious interaction within a church. This isn't talking about, well, the church gets along. This is talking about being united on a deeper level to pursue the Great Commission, to fulfill the purpose of the church. This isn't we just got along in our little group. This is we were united wholly and fully to promote the gospel, to advance the kingdom, to fulfill the Great Commission, to make sure the world knows the truth of God. That's the unity we're called to have to pursue excellence. That's the attitude we must have. And the reality is, when churches lose their single-minded commitment to the truth of Scripture and the pursuit of the kingdom, the advancement of the Great Commission... The kingdom suffers. The Great Commission suffers. Disputes take away from that. Think for just a minute in your mind. We all heard stories. 
We all heard stories of churches who got in such frivolous disputes when the government started saying, well, maybe you should wear a mask. Well, maybe you shouldn't wear a mask. And then churches tried to navigate. Do we wear a mask or do we don't? And we all heard stories of churches who became so divided over the issue of masking. All their time, all their energy was in a debate of masking while the world was dying and going to hell. And they didn't do a thing about it. They lost their unity, their commitment, their focus. They were no longer of one mind. We've all heard churches that suffer as factions form because this decision was made or this program is going on and this is my pet project and that's your pet project and this, that, and the other and little groups form for this and that and the other. In reality, the kingdom's not advanced because we're so fractioned and segmented, dysfunctional. We all know of churches that are clicking along and People get in and they become such good friends. They form what Tom Rainer calls little holy huddles. And it's such a good time with your friends that people come in and they can't really break in because it's just your little group. And there's a dysfunction there. The church can't grow because of that. The reality is this. Peter says if you want to live in excellence among the world, you start with developing an attitude of unity inside the church. Work to foster and nurture your attitude of single-minded commitment to Christ and his kingdom above all within the body. And that will flow outside the body. You'll live in excellence. Peter goes on. He says if you're going to have an attitude of excellence, there's another part to this. An attitude of excellence is an attitude of compassion, he says. An attitude of compassion. It's interesting that word compassion from the Greek is sympathis. It means suffering like one or feeling like one. It means I suffer the way you suffer and I feel what you feel. It's the root of our word sympathetic. If I'm to live out excellence, I must develop this attitude where I feel the pains and needs of others. I I'm so invested with my Lord that I can sense the needs and the pains others have. An attitude of compassion. Writing to the church of Corinth, Paul says, and if one member suffers, all members suffer. If one member is honored, all members rejoice. Within the family of God, we're so closely bonded that the suffering of one brings pain to all, and the rejoicing of one brings, brings gladness to all. Having an attitude of compassion where we feel what others feel, where we sense what others are going through. It happens within the body, it carries on out through the community where we sense, where we sense the needs and the pains of those around us. The book of Romans says rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Have this attitude where you're sensitive to the needs and the pains of those around you. Basically, we're to emulate the compassion of our Savior. We're to emulate the compassion of Christ. To foster and nurture an attitude, a way of thinking where we can emulate his compassion. If you read the Gospels, what you find is that Jesus was moved with compassion with those who had physical disease. He was moved with compassion for those who had a physical need. He was moved with compassion over those who were in emotional trauma. He was moved with compassion over those who were spiritually hurting, neglected, and dying. We're to emulate that. In Matthew 9, 36, the Bible says, But when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. He hurt when they hurt. He suffered because of their lostness. He felt it. He had an attitude, a heart of compassion. 
If we're to live out excellence, we need to grow that kind of attitude. This doesn't come natural for everyone. All of Christ's followers should be moved with compassion over the needs and the pains of others, but it doesn't come natural to all of us. In fact, this is something that I have struggled with. I remember years and years ago as Christy and I would be ministering to families, we would walk through trauma with families and she would just be physically hurting. She had such compassion, she would hurt for them. And to be honest with you, I, okay. I mean, I know all the answers the Bible says. Let me tell you the answers, I'm okay. But she was able to minister in such a deeper way. So I started to pray, God, God, I need a heart that will hurt with the hurting. God, I need a heart that will sense their pain and feel what they're feeling so that I can get on their level. God answered my prayer. And it's not always fun to hurt with other people. It's not always easy to walk in pain with them. But it brings you to a deeper level of connection and ministry whereby you can truly minister the grace and the love of Christ. When you have an attitude of compassion and you sense their pain and walk through their pain with them. You see, my friends, our compassion should be stirred for people who are hurting and in need. And it should be stirred the strongest for those who are in spiritual need and spiritual pain and spiritual hunger. We should be moved to feel what they feel and sense their spiritual need and act upon that to help them. If we're going to live out excellence, we have to develop an attitude of compassion towards them. And true compassion is going to be revealed in action. Indifference and insensitivity are not Christ-like characteristics. And if you can sit there being indifferent to the suffering of those around you, you do not have a compassionate heart like Christ. That's something you need to ask that he would help instill within you. But Peter goes on talking about attitudes of excellence. He says the next thing is we must have brotherly love. If I'm to have an attitude of excellence, it's going to involve brotherly love. To love like brothers. Living in excellence will demand a genuine, loving affection for others. A love that genuinely is expressed. A love that really doesn't happen naturally, but is imparted to you through Christ in you to affect other people. A genuine care and affection for those around you. This is a mark of a believer. In fact, Jesus himself in John 13 said, the mark, the distinguishing characteristic, the earmark of being my follower is the love you're going to show. When my love inundates your heart, it will flow out of you. There will be a genuine concern and affection towards those around you. We must develop and nurture an attitude of love. And this is a love that will embrace sacrificial service to others. That's the kind of love we're talking about. A love that sees someone else being moved with that compassion and says, I love you enough to sacrificially serve you however I can. I will do whatever it takes to see you experience Christ his presence, and his love. This is the attitude of love that glorifies Jesus because it's the attitude that expresses his love, that allows the world to understand his love. This is the kind of love that you sacrificially display and it comes back to bring glory to Christ and honor your faith. In fact, in the book of 3 John, you see an example of this. There's a man named Gaius there. And he is someone who has a genuine love and affection for others, who sacrificially serves others. John says there that he served those within the church as well as strangers without the church. And here's what happened. That love resulted in those who came and bore witness before God. The love he showed because of his faith in Christ ended up in giving a good testimony to his faith, about his faith. It was a genuine love expressed in a genuine way that ended up coming back and saying, here's a man who has the love of Christ. And people gave testimony to the genuineness of his serving love. 
That's the attitude of love we need if we're going to live out excellence. Peter goes on. Still in verse 8, he says, if you're going to have an attitude of excellence, it will be an attitude of tenderheartedness. He says there, love is brothers, be tenderhearted. Tenderheartedness. Now that phrase carries the, the connotation of having a good heart, being good hearted. It's what you and I would probably define as being kind. That's probably the best best explanation of what he means there, to be kind, to have a kind heart. See, if I'm going to live out excellence, I must nurture within myself a heart that is kind. To live above reproach means nurturing this mindset that will allow me to demonstrate kindness instead of harshness. You see, Many of us are naturally inclined towards harshness. We can respond harshly to people just like that. It's within us. It's human nature. We can respond with harshness even when we're right. We can respond with harshness when we're wrong. But to live out excellence, I have to develop this way of thinking that says I will respond with kindness instead of harshness. And so when I need to address my children, I will administer the discipline that needs to be administered with kindness, not harshness. When I need to address a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, and correct some things, I will approach them with kindness, not harshness. It doesn't mean letting things go unresolved or ignoring problems. It just means addressing them in a way that will help you maintain excellence and be above reproach. You develop an attitude of kindness, not harshness. It takes discipline. You want to practice. You want to nurture this. So when a person makes a mistake, when a person hurts our feelings... When a person wrongs us, we have nurtured a way of thinking that allows us to respond appropriately through kindness without harshness. It's basically this. It's knowing what someone really deserves, but demonstrating grace because you have nurtured a tendered heart. Because that is exactly what Jesus has done for each of us. Jesus knows exactly full well what we all truly deserve. He knows the ramifications of our sin, the condemnation and suffering and shame that it brings. He knows the reality that we truly deserve eternity in a place called hell. But from the tenderness of his heart, he's offered us kindness through his grace rather than condemnation. And so we emulate him as we deal with others if we're to live in excellence. Nurture kindness. Being acutely aware that there's stuff going on in other people's lives. Being tenderhearted so that mitigating factors they're dealing with you might consider before you bite their head off. Nurturing grace within your heart that you respond appropriately. But Peter keeps going. The next thing he says, if you're going to have an attitude of excellence, you must be courteous. Courteous. An attitude of excellence is an attitude that is courteous. Now, we need some clarification here. This word is philaron, and it does mean courteous, but more than that, it means to be low-minded. To be low-minded. And in this text, low-minded is the more accurate translation. In other words, to have a humble spirit. To have a humble spirit is required if I'm going to have an attitude of excellence. Not to be so full of selfishness and pride, which, by the way, we're all naturally inclined towards. 
but to nurture a spirit of humility that plays out as I live this life. A humble spirit. See, the call to excellence requires us to nurture humility, to have a humble spirit. In fact, here in a couple of chapters as we continue this study, we're going to see Peter say we are to be clothed with humility. It's to be our garment and our covering. We're to pursue humility. In the book of Ephesians, the Bible says to walk worthy of the calling in which we were called, we must do so with lowliness and gentleness. That's humility. To walk worthy of the calling Christ has put on our lives, to live as his ambassadors with excellence, we must nurture an attitude of humility. We have to let go of selfishness and pride. By the way, if you really want to get to the root of sin, if you want to pull back the layers, here's what you'll find. Selfishness and pride at the root of every sin. That's why to live with excellence, we have to nurture humility and let go of selfishness and pride. In fact, Jesus, talking to his disciples, set them down one day and he said, look, I'm going to tell you who the greatest is because they were in an argument. Who's going to be the greatest? 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 And here's what he told them. You can read this in Matthew 18. He set them down and he said, listen, the one who has the most humble spirit is the greatest in my kingdom. To live lives of excellence, to demonstrate Christ to others requires humility. But Peter continues. This guy was long-winded, y'all. Here's what he says. An attitude of excellence is a forgiving attitude. You see that in verse 9. It's a forgiving attitude. He says not re returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. That is to be forgiving. Now he's already approached this. We studied that few weeks back. He's already approached this and offered Jesus up as the prime example. He said Jesus did not return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. He reminded everyone when Jesus was misused, abused, shamed, and being killed, rather than returning evil for evil and reviling for reviling, he simply offered forgiveness. Remember there at the cross speaking about those who had done all this to him, he simply prayed, Father, forgive them. Forgiveness is an attitude of excellence. To be above reproach in our lives, we must be forgiving, not vindictive. Here it says don't return evil. Evil refers to any inherently bad quality. Any inherently bad thing. When someone does something bad to you, you simply don't do something bad back. You forgive. Reviling refers to abusive language. When someone mistreats you, abuses you, talks bad about you, does whatever, you forgive. You don't rail against that person. You don't condemn that person. You don't speak badly about that person. You offer forgiveness. If you're to live out excellence, it's going to require forgiveness. Forgiveness. Peter went to Jesus one day and said, hey, Peter, I'm going to forgive this dude Shoot, I'm going to forgive him like seven times. And Peter said, uh-huh. Jesus like, Peter, no, you got it all wrong, dude. You're going to forgive and 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 forgive, and you're not going to count. You're just going to forgive. Because if you're going to emulate me and you're going to live out my character and you're going to live with excellence in this world, you're going to have to forgive a lot of people over and over and over again. But you're going to forgive. That's an attitude of excellence. One last attitude of excellence he names here. And that is an attitude of blessing. An attitude of blessing. We're to return a blessing to people. To be a blessing to people. And to bless people, you have to have nurtured that within your heart. Because this isn't a, oh, bless your heart. This is a blessing. This is God working through you to bless someone else. And you have to have nurtured that in your heart because when someone wrongs you, it is not human nature to bless them. You have to have nurtured an attitude of blessing. 
See, our hearts and our minds must already be set towards loving the evil one, praying for the one who spitefully uses us, doing good to the one who mistreats us, forgiving the one who hurts us. We must already have nurtured that in our hearts. To lay our lives before the Lord and say, Lord, use me as a vessel to bless others. To focus your mind on this reality that I want to live out excellence. So, Lord, make me a living conduit to bless those around me, even those who hurt me or misuse me or cause suffering in my life. Lord, allow me to be a blessing to others. If I'm to live out excellence, I must nurture that attitude. And here's what happens. When we nurture attitudes that promote excellence, our actions begin to reveal excellence. And that's where Peter goes next in his explanation. He moves from attitudes to actions. And he says, let me tell you about some actions of excellence. There are some actions that will show the excellence you have nurtured within your heart. Because what's in the heart comes out. So when you nurture attitudes of excellence, your conduct will display it. These begin with verse 10, and I want you to look. Verse 10 begins, for he who would. F-O-R. That's an important word because it is linking what is going to happen in verses 10 and 11 to what has been said in verses 8 and 9. Peter says because of verse 8 and 9, verse 10 and 11 will happen. When you nurture the right heart and mind of excellence, your life will live out the excellence that's within your heart. He says these are actions of excellence. When you are disciplined to nurture these attitudes, your actions will match. Here's the first one he lists, verse 10. He says, keeping our tongue from evil. That's an action that reveals excellence. Keeping our tongue from evil. Controlling our speech and using our words properly to promote the excellence of Christ. Peter mentions this first, I think, because, well, it's probably one of the biggest problems Christians have. We like to run our mouths. The reality is, when I nurture attitudes that pursue excellence, my words will reflect those attitudes. What comes forth from the mouth, Jesus taught us, reveals what's in the heart. My attitude of excellence will be reflected with my words, with my speech. Now, keeping our tongue from evil is not always easy. In fact, if you read the book of James, chapter 3, James has a lot to say there about your mouth and how you use it, about your tongue and what it can do. James tells us the tongue will defile our entire existence. The entire life we live can be defiled by the words we say. The entirety of our testimony and our Christian witness can be ruined with such a few small words. And once again, let me remind you, as sometimes I do, those small words sometimes appear in print form on Facebook and Twitter, things that are popped up on Instagram and Snapchat and et cetera and et cetera and so forth. And if you put it out there, even if you delete it, it's still somewhere, my friends. It's still out there somewhere. Your tongue can defile your entire existence. James said your tongue, it'll be the hardest thing to tame. He said it's the hardest thing in the world to tame. In fact, there in the book of James, he says, mankind has tamed all of creation, yet cannot tame the tongue. But when I nurture and am disciplined, to grow attitudes of excellence, those attitudes will work through my speech. It will help tame my mouth. James says your tongue is simply evil and full of deadly poison. That's why you need to develop the right attitude in the heart because if you left your tongue unchecked, it's going around killing people. James says, you know what happens with the tongue? 
you bless God and you curse men made in his image. And he said, people, this just ought not be. He just said, man, that's just wrong. It is just wrong for you to come in here and worship God then use the same mouth to run people down and talk bad about stuff. Just not right, he says. In fact, here's what he says. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus there is no spring that yields both salt water and fresh. You either get your attitude of excellence right so that your mouth reflects it or you don't. But you're not going to mix both. An action that reveals our pursuit of excellence revolves around how we use our words. And born-again believers should reflect their transformed hearts by the taming of their tongues. Use your words for excellence. That's possible when you have a disciplined mind seeking to be above reproach, when you have the right attitude of excellence. Peter continues. He says, there's another attitude of excellence I want you to see. Still in verse 10. Keeping our lips from lying. Keeping our lips from lying. You're like, well, that's using your mouth. Well, there's a bigger connotation here. It's being committed to the truth in its entirety. Being committed to truth as we pursue excellence. Not just speaking truth or lie, but being fully committed, vested entirely in our lives to the truth. I mean, we know things like the book of Proverbs says, he who speaks truth declares righteousness. It's important to speak truth. But it's also important to be fully committed, invested with an integrity based off faith, where your life is in a, a life of integrity reflecting the character of Christ as you're committed to the truth in every avenue of life. Your dedication to truthfulness in all areas is a reflection of your pursuit of righteousness, your desire to live out excellence. This, this is a, a commitment to truth with transparency so that people understand the integrity that is in Christ. It's not just speaking a truth or speaking a lie. It's living the truth and being fully vested and committed to the truth. It's having enough integrity to stand in the truth even when it's not advantageous to you even when it might bring harm to you. It's having the integrity of Christ to stand on the truth, to speak the truth. That's well, what Paul wrote to Timothy about Jesus as he stood before Pilate and said Jesus stood firm and spoke the truth. It is being fully committed to the truth no matter what. Absolutely in what we speak, but in every avenue of life. It's having the right attitude about living in truth and integrity. You know, there are those people, you'll talk to them and they're like, well, listen, you know, I, I didn't lie. I just didn't tell them how it really was. Oh, is that right? You lied. That's not integrity. Well, you know, no, I, I told the truth. I, I just didn't tell all the truth. Oh, really? You lied. That's not integrity. Well, you know, I, I did what was right. I just didn't. I just didn't do everything this way or that way because I wanted to come out a little bit better. Oh, really? That's not integrity. To live lives of excellence, we live with the integrity of Christ that demonstrates his character. It's a commitment to honesty in every avenue of life, in all that we do. In fact, what really is the overriding emphasis here is to avoid hypocrisy. Simply to avoid hypocrisy. You see, as there's inconsistencies in our speech, in our declaration, in our promises, in our actions, when we don't represent the integrity and truthfulness of Christ in all we do, what we are are hypocrites. We flounder in hypocrisy because we compromise on being completely truthful and demonstrating integrity in all we do. The call here is to act with full integrity to avoid hypocrisy. Speak the truth of God and then live it fully. Declare the statutes of Scripture and keep them completely. Make promises to people and follow through fully. 
Be the kind of person that someone else can deal with and know I shook their hand, it will happen. There's no hypocrisy in that person. That is a person who reflects the integrity of Christ fully in every avenue and area of life. But Peter continues. He says, if you're going to carry out these attitudes into action, it's going to involve turning from evil. You see that in verse 11. Turning from evil. That is rejecting what is unrighteous, fleeing from sin so that we can reflect excellence in all we do in life. If I'm to live out the excellence of Christ, to be above reproach in what I do, then I have to be distinctly separate from the sins of the world, those things that are unrighteous before God. I must be intentional to be distinct and separate. I have to... Look at what is inherently bad, what God would consider unrighteous, and be intentional in avoiding those things. Peter's going to go on to say, we won't get to it today, but we will shortly, that we should have ceased from sin, that we no longer should live the rest of our time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but to live for the will of God. You see... If I'm really going to live actions of excellence, it means being distinctly separate from the flesh, from the will of the flesh, from that which is unrighteous, to pursue the will of God in my life, to live in a way that I know this is what pleases God, to pursue that which helps me abide in his will, to develop this attitude of of excellence that naturally inclines me towards God and not pleasing myself, to live that out, to think the right way so I act the right way in pursuing God's will in my life, to live for God, to please him. That is to turn from evil and seek him to do good according to God. And that's the very next action he mentions. Doing good. Doing good. I'm going to reject and flee from that which is unrighteous and sinful that does not honor God and move towards doing good. That is doing that which is pleasing to God. I'm going to be deliberate in seeking to do what is good before God. I'm going to intentionally seek to live out actions that are excellent according to God. What does God say is excellent? And that's what I'm going to do. That's doing good. In fact, my friends, you have been redeemed. That is, you have been purchased out of sin, rescued from the punishment of sin. You have been given a new life in Christ. If you've called out to him in repentance, you have been transformed, the Bible says, to do good works that God has already planned out for you. You see that in Ephesians 2.10. The Bible teaches there that God has rescued you out of sin. He's transformed you spiritually. And now he's set you on a course to do good works that he has planned for you. To do good. To do good. Now this isn't just do good in your neighborhood. You know, get your neighbor's cat out of the tree. I did good. This is doing what God has called you to do. His good works. Pursuing the good works of his kingdom he's laid before you. Being intentional to do the good works of his kingdom so you can pursue excellence in front of the world. And you know what happens? When you focus on doing those good things God has called you to do, your conduct stands out as excellent by itself. People recognize what you do and they see that it's different and you stand out distinctly. Peter has pointed this out already in chapter 2, verse 12. He said, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. The world is going to see your good works. They're going to observe that, and they're going to recognize the distinction of your excellence, and some of them are going to come to faith. That's what Jesus talked about on the Sermon on the Mount, right? In Matthew chapter 5 where he said, look, just let your good works, just let your good works shine before men. Let them see your good works and they'll come to glorify your Father who is in heaven. 
Be distinct in your actions as you do what God has called you to do in his kingdom and let the world take note that you're living for God. That you're living in excellence. One last action Peter mentions. Like, yes, finally. One last action. If I'm to live out actions of excellence, he says, I need, I need to be seeking and pursuing peace. Seeking and pursuing peace. Now, that phrase, seeking and pursuing, is very interesting because what it suggests is very aggressively, being aggressive in working to capture peace. The illusion is that of an avid hunter tracking his prey relentlessly. To live in excellence, I must be one who will track down peace among people relentlessly. To be aggressive in pursuing it. You see, lives of excellence, they're lives that demonstrate a godly peace. A peace that maintains tranquility and joy. And you have this if you're a follower of Christ through faith, a true born-again believer. You see, you have, a, you have a peace that's not situational, it's not transient, it's not based on circumstance. You have this divine peace, a divine peace that is present with you. You have the peace described in 2 Thessalonians 3, where the Bible says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. You have that peace. But having that divine peace within you, you now must pursue peace with others. In fact, Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. As much as depends on you, you pursue peace. You be the peacemaker. You be the one that promotes tranquility and joy. You let the peace of God that's been implanted within your heart to shine through the clouds of chaos as other people see you trying to establish a peacefulness in your relationships. You pursue peace. If you're going to live out excellence, you be a peacemaker in the world. And so Paul, excuse me, Peter... Peter lays out these attitudes you have because you want to be excellent in representing Jesus and how those attitudes flow over into actions you live out so that you can live out the excellency of Christ. But then he sums it all up with some accolades that come because of excellence. Some accolades. That is, there are some blessings that will come to you because of this. There are some very specific blessings mentioned here. Blessings received by those who endeavor to live out excellence in their lives, to represent Christ well, to be above reproach. In fact, what Peter's doing here is he's quoting from Psalm 34. You can go back and look at that sometime and see the parallel. And he's going to point out three things. Let me go through these very quickly for you. Three blessings that are yours because you're pursuing excellence in Christ. First is a life we love. A life we love. You see that in verse 10? He who would love life. Now, here's the thing. This is not merely loving life. When, when this text here says, he who would love life, it, it carries a much deeper value than I love life. What it refers to here is actually experiencing the absolute fullness of life that is active and vigorous, being devoted to God, and therefore it's blessed. You see, what Peter's saying is when you pursue excellence, the blessing you will receive is that you will experience the fullness of an active and vigorous life committed to God's will, and the result is being blessed in that life. As you pursue excellence, it naturally moves you to living a life that God blesses. You function under the blessing of God. Now, this absolutely is not a statement that there is no suffering or hardship in life. Remember who Peter's writing to. He's writing to people under persecution. 
It's not life without suffering, but it is life lived in the fullness in Christ. And therefore, it's a blessed life. Then he goes on to say, there's a second thing. He said, he who would love life and see good days. Good days. I wish he would have said happy days and Fonzie could have come out. There you go. Good days. To see good days, my friends, is to experience a life that is distinguished and honorable and therefore joyful. A life that is distinguished and honorable and therefore joyful. It's living a life in pursuit of the excellence of Christ to the point that that life is distinguished and honorable before the Lord. And living that life brings joy. Once again, not a promise of an easy life, not a life without suffering, but a life distinguished among the world, honorable before God, and joyful because you're pursuing the excellence of Christ in all you do. Both these things point us to eternity. Both these statements reflect eternity. Life we love and seeing good days ultimately, my friends, points to the fulfillment of our redemption as we experience eternal life in the goodness of God's presence throughout eternity. So Peter not only brings it to here, he points it to there. These blessings are eternal. They're eternal as you pursue excellence in Christ because of your relationship with Christ. Then he says one other thing, one other blessing that comes as we do this, and that's God's favor. God's favor. In verse 12 it says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. The eyes of the Lord are upon us. A reference to God's special care and watchfulness over his children. God's special interest and care over those who are pursuing his will in living out excellence. I live out excellence even in the face of hardship, knowing that my heavenly Father is watching so carefully over me. You might note that it says it's promised to the righteous there. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous Those who have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, invited Jesus into their life to be their Savior, and now are living for him in pursuit of excellence, they have the watchfulness of God. If you're here without Christ this morning, this is not you. You do not have the special care and attention of God as your Heavenly Father. In fact, the Bible says you're alienated and separated from God. This is for those who are believers in Christ and are pursuing his excellence. And it says the ears of the Lord are open to us. God is listening to, he's interacting with us as we speak to him in prayer. He's not a distant stoic God sitting up on his high mountain on a throne. He's the God there in the prayer closet with us, interacting as we commune with him. Our Heavenly Father is listening to our cries and attentive to our words because we are His children pursuing His excellence in this world. You see, my friends, you're called to have attitudes of excellence, to live out actions of excellence. But my goodness, the accolades God brings into your life are far greater than we can even describe. You're here today, and I have to wonder... Who here today is fostering and nurturing and being disciplined in growing a heart of excellence? Which of those among us are committed to carrying out actions of excellence? Are there those here who are missing the blessings of God? 
because they just don't care about being within God's will and pursuing his excellence. Are there those here among us today who, well, you don't even have a chance of experiencing this because you've never come to faith in Jesus. You never called out to him and asked him to come into your life and rescue you from sin. Where are you at today, my friend? And what do you need to do with God today? I want to have a word of prayer, and you're going to have a chance to respond to God. And that's all I'm going to ask you to do. You respond to God however he's speaking to your heart. Heavenly Father, I ask now that you move among us, that you draw each one of us to the place where we need to be with you. And I pray you give us courage and boldness to respond appropriately. Lord, I pray by the power of Jesus, you would remove all distraction and hindrances, that we might just simply respond to you and your spirit now.